Our next lecture is on JSF navigation. The controller layer of the MVC design pattern requires a mechanism for navigating from one view to another. JSF implements the controller layer with a navigation handler in combination with page backing beans. The default JSF navigation handler supplies action outcome style navigation rules in order to transition from one view to another. Sources of logical outcomes include the return value of an action method, the action attribute of a UI command component, for example here we have an H command button whose action outcome is entries.xhtml. We can also have the outcome attribute of a UI outcome target. And finally, the handle navigation method of the navigation handler API. Here is an example navigation case as defined in a faces config file. We have our, of course, encapsulating navigation rule elements. And within that, we have our from view ID, which is our current page. And in this case, it's page1.xhtml. Below that, we have our navigation case. So if the from outcome, our logical outcome, is success, we're going to transition to the view ID page2.xhtml. For explicit navigation to take place, well, when success is fed into the navigation handler from page 1, the application will forward the user to page 2.xhtml. And this can be done in one of two ways here. The first is a hard-coded string. So we have an H command button whose action attribute has a hard-coded value of success, which corresponds to our from outcome from the previous slide. Or we can return this value as a from a bean method. Here we have a command button with an action of add applicant. And add applicant is going to return to us a value, a string value of success, which again is our from outcome. And we'll then, navig we'll then navigate to page 2.xhtml. We can also use wildcards in explicit navigation by adding an asterisk in the from view ID. And this is going to mean that, well, in any starting page, if that from outcome applies, well, we're going to transition to the to view ID. And leaving out the from outcome, all return values except for null will always mean redisplay. We can use conditional navigation, so a condition as match criteria in our navigation case. The conditional if element is going to be a child of our navigation case element and is expressed using an expression language value expression. So here we have a navigation rule with a from view ID, which could be any starting page as denoted by the asterisk, our wildcard. And below that we have our specific navigation case. If the from outcome is job applicant page, and well, if applicants, the array list applicants is not full, we're going to transition to the view ID job applicant.xhtml. For implicit navigation, when a navigation case cannot be matched, the navigation handler checks to see whether the action outcome, outcome corresponds to a view ID. If we return null, that would, in, would mean to redisplay the current page. If we return applicants, as we do in our add applicant method, we're going to forward to applicants.xhtml. And if we return applicants followed by a faces redirect equals true, we're going to perform a redirect rather than a forward. It takes in place entirely on the server, whereas a redirect sends a command to the browser, commanding it to fetch a new URL and thus recreate the view. And that concludes our lecture on JSF navigation. Our next exercise is on JSF navigation. We are going to add explicit navigation to jobapplicant.xhtml and to applicants.xhtml. 
we are also going to use the conditional if element in our navigation rules. In the last exercise, we had used implicit navigation. We bound the action attribute to applicant controller dot add applicant. And when the user clicked the button, the string return value of the submit method was passed to the JSF navigation handler as an action outcome. And the navigation handler would then check to see whether the action outcome corresponds to a view ID. So previously, we were returning applicants and then our faces redirect equals true. And again, this was specifying a redirect rather than a forward. And by returning simply applicants, we were using implicit navigation. So step one is to now use explicit navigation. We're going to add the following navigation rule to our application by adding this snippet of code to our faces config file. So if our current view, our from view ID, is applicants.xhtml and our from outcome <clears throat> is job applicant page, well we're going to transition to the page to the view ID job applicant.xhtml. So we'll take this piece of code and we're then going to come here to our IDE. And we're going to go into our faces config file. And we're going to add our first explicit navigation rule. So we'll just add that below our lifecycle definition. Step two is to add an H button. So in applicants.xhtml before our table, we're going to add a new button which is going to use our new navigation rule. The outcome job applicant page coincides with the from outcome element in our navigation rule and as a result JSF is going to send us to the view ID job applicant.xhtml. So let's take this new button component and we're going to place it before our data table in applicants.xhtml. So we'll go into applicants and right above our table we're going to add our h colon button. Step three is to now run the application. So in applicants.xhtml we're going to press the button to have explicit navigation take us back to jobapplicant.xhtml and then in job applicant we're going to add a new job applicant by entering information and submitting our form and the action method bound to the submit applicant command button that we had previously added will use implicit navigation and redirect us back to applicants.xhtml so let's go to our IDE and I'm going to start my server and now we're just going to be able to transition back and forth between job applicant and applicants. So let's first try our new H button component. So we'll go to applicants and here it is here at the top, part, the top portion of our page. So I can click job applicant page and we transition back to job applicant. I can then enter in a new applicant. It doesn't quite matter what information I enter here. And I can submit the applicant and then we're taken to applicants.xhtml through implicit navigation and then explicit navigation by clicking the H button. For step four, we're going to add a navigation rule wildcard. So we're going to replace our from view ID with an asterisk. 
So we can be in any page in our application, and if the from outcome is job applicant page, well, we're going to navigate to the view ID job applicant.xhtml. So let's now just copy this piece of code and let's go to our faces config file. And we can simply just add an asterisk here. So now this navigation case applies to all views in our application. Now again, we can run the application and in applicants.xhtml we can press our H button to have explicit navigation to jobapplicant.xhtml and by adding that asterisk now any page can navigate to job applicant as long as the job applicant page string is fed into the navigation handler. So let's just make sure that this still works. So we'll just republish our application by restarting our server I find is an easy way to do that. And we're going to see no functional impact but let's just double check that well. We can still in fact navigate back to job applicant. So we'll hit applicants.jsf and I'll hit job applicant page and well okay perfect. Our wildcard navigation rule takes us back to job applicant. Step six is to now add conditional navigation. So we're going to add a condition when we attempt to navigate to jobapplicant.xhtml. So if applicants is full, returns false, we can navigate to jobapplicant.xhtml and create more job applicant instances. Otherwise, we are sent to start.xhtml. So here we have two navigation cases within one navigation rule element and with a from view ID of an asterisk which again is our wildcard meaning we can be in any page. So let's copy this section of code here and overwrite our existing navigation rules with ones that include now a conditional case. So we're just going to add our new navigation cases to our navigation rule or rules I should say. So again if the from outcome is job applicant page and applicants the array list possibly is not full we're going to navigate to jobapplicant.xhtml and the second navigation case is well if the from outcome is again job applicant page and the applicants list is full well we're going to navigate to the view ID start so now we need to add our boolean to applicants.java so we're going to add a instance variable called full and if we have more than one applicant well we're going to return true um, full is true so let's copy this code here and we'll take this to applicants.java so we'll expand Java resources and we're going to navigate to model and we're going to come to applicants.java and we can just paste this wherever So if we have more than one applicant, we're going to say that our, our list is full. Now let's restart our application and in our applicants xhtml page, we're going to press our button to have explicit navigation take us to jobapplicant.xhtml and in job applicant, we're going to add a job applicant. The action method bound to the submit applicant command button 
as we know, is going to use implicit navigation and redirect us to applicants. We're going to press the button again. So now we have created one job applicant. And explicit conditional navigation will now send us to start.xhtml. We're then going to return to the applicants manage bean and set is full to return false to remove the existing condition. So when we press the button again, that navigation case where, well, if if applicants is full returns true, well we're going to navigate to the view ID start. So let's restart our server. And let's first take a look at the, the case where applicants is full. So we'll follow along with our slides by starting off with applicants. We're going to click our button for explicit navigation. And in this case, we don't have any applicants, so is full returns false. And I'm now going to create an applicant. And we'll submit our applicant and transition to applicants.xhtml. But now we do have one job applicant. So our isFull method is going to now return true. So if I click on job applicant page, our conditional if, well, is now going to take us to start.jsf as, as per our navigation cases. To alter this, we can go back into applicants.java and we can simply hard code in false. And we'll just restart. So we'll now perform those same sequence of steps. We'll click on job applicant. There are no applicants, so we're going to transition to job applicant. We'll just quickly create a fake applicant. And we're going to transition to applicants.jsf. But now our is full method is returning false. So when we click on the job applicant page button, well, we're going to navigate back to job applicant. Step eight is now to add a cancel button. So we're going to add an h command button whose action is using implicit navigation. So we're returning an outcome of cancel job applicant. We have immediate set to true so that we execute the method, the action, before the process validations phase. So let's copy our command button code and we'll place this below our clear button in job applicant. So let's go to job applicant and scroll down and below our clear method We'll add our cancel button. In step nine, we're going to add another explicit navigation rule. So the clear button uses implicit navigation, but the cancel button will use explicit navigation by adding the following in our faces config. And note the addition of the redirect element. So previously we had returned, well actually in our add applicant method, we can see that going to our applicant controller, we can see that our return value was applicants and we've also specified faces redirect equals true. Now to do this in our faces config file, well, we add the redirect tag to our navigation case and again a JSF forward takes place entirely on the server, whereas a redirect sends a command to the browser telling it to fetch 
a brand new URL and also recreate the view. So let's take this navigation case and let's add it to our list of navigation rules. Now again, we have immediate set to true on our cancel command button so that we execute the action before the process validations phase. So navigation takes place before validation and conversion has a chance to fail. So with immediate set to true, our action is going to happen in the apply request values phase as per our lecture on the JSF lifecycle. Now in Eclipse, we can review our navigation flow. So there is a design time screen for navigation rules and it should contain a flow diagram that resembles the image on our slide. So to have a look at the navigation flow, coming back to Eclipse and going to our faces config file, here we're using the source view. But what we can also do is have a look at the navigation rule. And generally this requires that while well, we reopen our faces config, so I'm just going to close off everything for now. I'm going to reopen the faces config and click on navigation rule. And although not perfect, Eclipse does attempt to lay this out for us. I'll just make this a little bit easier for us to all see. And so Eclipse provides the functionality to show us our navigation flow in our application. And finally, we can run our application and in job applicant, we're going to add a job applicant with valid or invalid entries. And what we're going to do is we're going to use the cancel command button for explicit navigation back to applicants.xhtml. So sorry, let's just make sure that all of our changes have been pushed across. Since we did make modifications to our faces config file. And in job applicant, we now have a cancel button. And we can enter in some information. And perhaps we can click the submit button so we have our validation occurring. But we know we're no longer interested in perhaps submitting this job applicant. So we click the cancel button and we use explicit navigation to transition back to applicants.jsf or xhtml, sorry. And that concludes our exercise on JSF navigation. We will now discuss facelets. Many of the features of JSF are designed to be pluggable and extendable, such as the view handler. The default view handler for JSF was designed for JSP, but this was somewhat of a technology mismatch with JSF and did place limitations on developers. So here's an example of uh, a limitation placed by JSP. The original design decision made by the JSF 1.1 spec was to use JSP pages that contain XML syntax. So here we have um, a JSP root tag and nested within that tag is our JSP directive page on our F view elements and within that an H output text component with a value of hello world. Now using JSP in this manner made it difficult to mix JSF component markup with HTML because JSP did not treat HTML as first class components. So there would be no guarantee that our break HTML tag would end up in the same location. So here we have our output text components for value hello and world and within that we have our break tag. So the workaround in JSF 1.1 was to surround HTML markup with an F verbatim tag and this would ensure that the HTML break tag would always be rendered in the same location. So this could become quite annoying.
Forcing XML style JSP conventions was not well received by developers and Facelets is an alternative view handler to JSP that removes the previous limitations and provides powerful templating and composite component features. And as we, as we know, JSP support has been dropped from JSF, so Facelets is the premier view handler. The following Facelets XHTML markup is equivalent to the JSP markup from the previous slide. It is much more condensed and here we have HTML tags which are treated as first class components by Facelets. So by using Facelets we entirely remove JSP from JSF. We're using XML compliant HTML documents instead of Java server pages. We use a SAX XML, well Facelets uses a SAX XML parser to parse XHTML instead of the Jasper JSP compiler and benefits include that Facelets creates a lighter weight component tree and is approximately 30% faster at compiling and parsing pages than the Jasper JSP compiler. As I've mentioned, HTML elements become first class JSF components. Facelets has a templating feature created specifically for JSF and we can also create composite components. Additional features include enhanced error reporting, live development of JSF views, expression language value bindings can exist anywhere on the page, so bean values can be placed in a page without using the JSF component binding. Facelets provides a tag library with a handful of components such as UI include, UI composition, UI define, UI decorate, and UI repeat many of which we'll see in our upcoming exercises. And finally, it allows for dynamic include. So we can dynamically insert and remove components from the component tree using a UI include. And this is specifically helpful, or particularly helpful, for including pages within our page. So this reduces memory overhead of large component trees. Facelets is the standard view handler for JSF2 and as we know JSP support is at a standstill. Facelets provides many new composite component features in JSF2.0 and the best of Ken Paulson's JSF templating has been incorporated into Facelets. And that concludes our introduction to Facelets. Let's now discuss Facelets templating before implementing it within our application. Templating provides an intuitive mechanism for defining logical areas of the page. So it's used to separate layout from data input output. So we're going to be using two terms. Template, which is the XHTML page used as a layout controller, and template client, which is the XHTML page that uses a template to lay out specific content. So for our template, logical areas of a page are going to be defined using the UI insert tag with a name attribute. Default content can be added and if a named insert is not implemented then these default values will be rendered. So below here is an example template layout. We have div tags which are going to be used to style our page, our template. and Within those tags, we have our UI insert tags. So first we have a UI insert for our header, followed by menu, content, and footer. So our template client is going to insert its data into these logical areas as defined by our UI inserts. Now for the template client, JSF pages using a template define the named insert areas inside of a UI composition or UI decorate tags. So for example, here we have a UI composition which has a template attribute corresponding to our page template.xhtml, our, our template. And within that we have one UI define. So this is going to define our content area. And within that we're using a UI include to dynamically include perhaps uh, a page within our, within our template. 
So the URL is going to be directed at our template client and the template client is going to declare which template to use. The template client defines the content to be used with a UI define tag and path references in templates are resolved from the path location of the template client. So let's go now and add templating to our application. Our next exercise is on facelets templating. The goal of this exercise is to create a basic facelets template that can be used by template clients in our job application project. Our first step is to create a template folder and file. So we're going to create a folder called templates in our webinf directory and we're going to create that in webinf because it protects the templates from direct client access. If these templates were in our web folder, they may be accidentally rendered if their URL is called. We're also going to create template.xhtml within this new templates folder. So going to our IDE, we're going to right click on WebIM and we're going to create a folder called templates. And within templates, I'm going to create a file called template.xhtml. We're now going to add our template content. Let's first copy this to our, to our newly created file. Now, in the head portion of our page, we have an EL expression here for title. So in our template client, we're going to pass in the title to our template layout using a UI param tag. And below the title, we have a CSS style sheet reference, so we're going to create a file called template.css, which will contain our style classes. And then within the body of our template are, are our logical areas of our page. So we're going to define a header, menu, content, and footer areas. And each is surrounded by a div tag that's going to, to style them uh, accordingly. Step three is to now turn our applicants page into a template client. So we're going to add a UI composition tag now. This is the templating tag that's going to wrap content to be included in, in another facelet. So any content outside of the UI composition tag is going to be ignored by the facelet view handler. Our composition tag has a template attribute which points to our template file. And then within it, we have our UI param tag, which is going to pass the title of our page. And in this case, it's applicant system. And below that, we have our defined areas for header, menu, content, and footer. So within menu, we're going to place our H button. Within content will be our data table. And our footer will be our server output for our submitted applicants. So again, all of this data input as defined in our using our UI define tags is going to be inserted into the areas in our template based on the name so name header menu content and footer so let's go and add this code to our applicants.xhtml so we'll copy this first portion and we'll place that below our body tag We'll then grab this next section to close off our menu and open up our content section. So this will go below our H button tag. And then accidentally I moved slides there, so we're just going to grab our, our footer section here. And we'll place that after our data table. And then finally, we'll grab our closing tags, which are going to just go above our closing body tag. So we've now turned applicants.xhtml into a template client that uses our, uses our template layout. Now let's do the same for job applicant. So we're just going to, after the body tag, 
add our facelets tags. So we're going to pass in a title, again, applicant system. And we're going to add an H button, which is going to take us directly to our applicants.xhtml page. And then we're going to surround our form tag here with the, the content define. So let's go to job applicant and just after our body, we'll add our facelets tags. And then after our form, we're going to add our footer section. So we'll scroll all the way down, look for our closing form tag. And then right below our final body tag, let's just add our closing UI define and closing UI composition tags. And again, now we've turned job applicant into a template client that utilizes our template layout. Step five is to now create a file in our CSS folder called template.css and we're going to do this under web resources. So we're now going to add our, our style sheet which will contain our CSS style classes. So under web, we're going to create a folder called resources. And under resources, we're going to create another folder called CSS. And then under CSS, we're going to create a new file called template.css. Now, let's paste the following CSS style classes into our template.css file. So here are styles for our header, footer, and content areas. So we'll just copy this and go back to our IDE. We'll just paste that right in. And then styles for menu and content body. Step seven, we can now republish our project and run it. And we can now see the applied template to both job applicant and applicants.xhtml. Okay. So let's hit our URL and we can now see that we have a nice template layout for applicants and also for jobapplicant.xhtml. And that concludes our exercise on facelets templating. Facelets composite components. Without composite components, a developer has to either create a new UI component or extend or modify an existing UI component. Now, both options are more effort due to the requirement of creating a renderer, tag handler, and component class. So when is it necessary to create a new UI component? Well, if low-level control over rendering is needed, or no other components can be combined to meet requirements. Composite components and facelets are a form of code reuse. We can package commonly used markup and associate it with a unique namespace. And an example could be an H input text which would be used for uh, a date picker and a select one menu for its time zone. Composite components allow developers to quickly create components since we don't have to write a custom renderer or tag handler. Most importantly, when created properly, components are generic and reusable between projects. A namespace is provided by facelets for composite component development. It is java.sun.com slash jsf slash composite. 
An example page usage could be for the namespace for colon my, but in this case we've appended testcomp. Testcomp corresponds to a folder named testcomp in web slash resources of our project. And this is where our composite component tag source will be located. Again, the tag source of a composite component resides in an XHTML file. The source is created in two steps. We're first going to define a composite interface and then declare functionality with a composite implementation in the tag source. Here is an example of a composite component. First, we have our encapsulating UI component tag, and then within is our composite interface. This composite interface contains one composite attribute with a name of who, and it is a required attribute. Below our composite interface is our composite component implementation. First we have the hello string, followed by an h output text component whose value is referencing a composite attribute. In this case, we're using the standard notation which is cc.attrs and then the composite attribute name for who. To use this com composite component in our page, we would specify the namespace my, followed by greeter, and then the who attribute would be set to Pierre. And this is going to render out simply hello Pierre in our browser. The composite interface declares the attributes available when using the composite component tag. Again, we have the composite attribute name equals who and required equals true. So who is a required attribute when the composite component is used in a page? Multiple attribute tags can be declared in the tag source. The tag attributes include name, the attributes name when the composite component tag is used on the page. Required, which is that we require the page to supply a value for this attribute. The default value and the Java type. The composite implementation tag makes use of the variables from the composite interface and this is going to be the content of the composite component. It can, can contain JSF tags, plain HTML, ISIS components, and much more. The custom expression language, cc.attributes, short form, .rid, for example, is used to reference a composite attribute with the name our ID. And this is similar to our who attribute used previously in our slides. So referencing a composite component in the page is as simple as placing the namespace followed by the component name and any needed attributes. In this case, it's who equals Pierre. We define a namespace in our page. In this case, we've used the XML namespace my, and it corresponds to a folder test comp. And this test comp folder is located in our web resources folder of our project. And this folder is where the source, in this case our component is my colon greeter, the source for greeter.xhtml is located. Again, greeter.xhtml contains the composite interface and composite implementation code from our, from our basic example. Composite components do have additional features beyond passing elements via the composite attribute. You can use the composite action source, which is used for passing listeners from a page to a composite component. We can also use the composite editable value holder, which is used for passing input values from a page to a composite component. However, these are covered in our advanced materials. And that concludes our lecture on facelets composite components. Our next exercise will be on composite components. We typically group H output label, H input text, and H message tags together. But rather than repeatedly add these tags to our page, we're going to package them in a composite component, a field set tag. The dynamic parts of the source are going to be exposed through the composite component tag attributes, and the field set will provide two options in the layout of the source tags, one for a table layout and another for a floating div layout. So we are going to create a field set composite component and add that 
to our job application project. Step one is to create a tags folder in our web resources folder as a library for our component. We're then going to create fieldset.xhtml inside this new folder. So we're going to go to resources under web and we're going to right click and we're going to create a folder named tags. And then within tags, I'm going to create a file called fieldset.xhtml. And this is going to contain our composite component source. We're now going to add our tag content. So I'm going to first copy our UI component containing all of our needed namespaces, followed by the composite interface, which defines various attributes, one for ID, label, value, whether we're in a table or in a floating div, and a required attribute. So we'll paste that within fieldset.xhtml Now we're going to continue filling in field set. So now we're going to add the components implementation So we'll copy that and we'll paste that below our interface So you can see in our composite implementation that we are making use of the composite attributes using the standard EL notation for composite components. And here we create our field set component. So we have our output label, our input text, and our message. Now we have two sets, one for when we are in a table layout and the other for a floating div layout. Step three is to now use this tag in our page and this is quite simple to do. We're going to add a namespace reference to our HTML tag. We're going to use the prefix job app for our tag and this can be anything you would like to make it just as long as you point to the correct namespace and make use of the field set which corresponds to our field set source. So we'll take that namespace and we'll first copy that into our job applicant.xhtml page. So we'll add that here. And next we're going to use the tag. So we're going to now replace our first name, output label, input text, and message with this cohesive field set tag. We're going to have an ID, a label, value, a required attribute, and whether we are in a table or floating div layout, followed by two output texts which are simply placeholders since our panel grid expects three columns. So we'll take that now and we're going to replace our first name so here we have the three individual components. And we've replaced that with just one, a job app field set component. So a version of the field set component is actually used in production for floating div layouts, but 
In our application project, we're using a panel grid, uh, essentially a table for layout. And this is why the component has been created with an in table attribute to accommodate table layouts as well as floating div layouts. And as I mentioned, we've also added two dummy output text tags to fill the last two columns in our panel grid. So before we end off, let's start our server and make sure that our application runs as expected with this new component. And now we can refresh our job applicant page. And well, nothing has changed, but now field set, sorry, first name is a field set composite component. And that concludes our exercise on facelet composite components. JSF Ajax. Ajax is short for asynchronous JavaScript and XML. It provides applications with the ability to retrieve data from the server asynchronously in the background without interfering with the user's display and behavior of the existing page. Data is usually retrieved using the XML HTTP request object and Ajax was not built into JSF 1.1 or 1.2. The easiest way to add Ajax, and still is, is through third-party libraries such as IceFaces. JSF2 has introduced an Ajax request lifecycle, and Ajax is implemented with the new F Ajax tag. The F Ajax tag can be nested within a single component, or it can be wrapped around multiple components. The event attribute, in the case of our example, is hover, must be an event supported by the component the Ajax behavior is being applied to. So, for HTML components, this will be the set of supported DOM events for that component, plus action for action source components, and value change for editable value holder components. If an event is not specified, a default behavior is applied based on the parent component. So again, action for action source components such as buttons, and value change for editable value holder components such as input components. An Ajax render can render all updated portions of a page component tree or declare which components to render after execution of the lifecycle. To declare the page IDs that require rendering after the event, we would do the following. Here we have an H command button and nested within the command button is an F Ajax tag. So when we hover over the command button, we're going to cause a render to the output text with the ID of out. So here out and text are IDs of components that will participate in the render portion of the request processing lifecycle. Now other available keywords are this, form, all, and none, which we'll discuss a little bit later in our lecture. If we want to expand the effects of the client behavior, we can create a manage bean method taking an Ajax behavior event as its sole argument. So here we have a count listener, and this method can now be referenced by expression language as the listener argument of the F Ajax call. So here our F Ajax event is going to be triggered by a key up and we're going to cause a render to components with IDs text and count and our listener bean count listener will be fired as well. In JSF 1.1 and 1.2 when a form was submitted the entire form was processed by the JSF lifecycle on the server. However JSF 2 has introduced partial view processing. With JSF2, we can not only selectively render components, we can selectively execute components in the JSF lifecycle. The execute attribute of FAJAX can be set to the same selection options as render. The available keywords can contain this component, the entire form, all components, or no components.
Now valid values of the render and execute attributes include again all, all components in the view, at form, all components within the same form, none for no components in the view, and at this, the only the component that spawned the event. And that concludes our lecture on JSF 2.0 AJAX. Our next exercise is on JSF 2.0 AJAX. Currently in our application, the clear button results in a full page refresh. Now, the clear button really only applies to form elements, so we only need to render the form after clearing out component values. So what we can do is use the FAJAX tag to only re-render our form. What we're going to do is place an FAJAX tag within our clear command button. It's going to be triggered on click by event equals click. We're only going to render components in the current form, so render equals at form. We're going to fire our clear form listener and we want this to happen in the apply request values phase ahead of process validation so we set immediate equals true. So this command button is now going to make an AJAX call on click and only clear and re-render components within the current form. So let's take this command button and Let's go to jobapplicant.xhtml and let's replace our current clear button. We're also going to need to change the clear form method signature so it's now going to take an AJAX behavior event instead of an action event. So let's go to action applicant controller in our controller package and we're going to find the clear form method. So we'll just replace that. And then we'll hover over AJAX behavior event to import JAVAX faces event AJAX behavior event. And now let's run the application and we're going to use a tool called Firebug. We're going to open its console. We're going to click on clear and we're going to observe the form in the response. So coming back to my IDE, I'm going to restart my server. going to open up my browser and on the bottom right hand corner is my firebug icon and we're going to refresh and then what I'm going to do is select clear so now we have one post and let's have a look so we can see that in the response we have an Ajax partial response and we're basically updating only the form. So nothing outside of the form is sent in the response. So just all of our components inside of our form. And of course we can implement finer grained Ajax using the FAJAX tag. But with ice faces Ajax is built into our framework and our components. So while the JSF 2.0 Ajax, the F Ajax tag is helpful, well with ice faces application developers do not have to think in terms of browser events in the page and or how to apply the response to the page. We take care of all of this for you with automatic Ajax. And our next lecture will be an introduction to ice faces. And that concludes our exercise on JSF Ajax.